the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and gave this phenomenal word that she's going to be the instrument to bring the Son of God into the world. And then immediately, Gabriel encouraged her. And he said, now you have a cousin. And your cousin is six months along. I could just see the Gabriel saying, can you believe it? She who was barren is now six months along. And he sent, Gabriel sent Mary to the house of Elizabeth, her cousin. I think on the way there, she must have said, how am I going to explain this to my cousin? But when she got there, her cousin said, when I heard the sound of your voice, the babe in me leaped. And I said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What I've learned in the body of Christ, God gives you cousins. He does something inside you, and then he sends you to those who have the same thing going on inside you. Something's been birthed by God in you. I like to say, get around somebody who makes your baby jump. Hallelujah. Because you, you got the kingdom of God birthed in you. And Pastor Larry and I, we were talking about this because we go back 40 some, 40 some years. Or, it's scary. Yeah, it is a lifetime. And, uh, but we've been cousins all these years. Because the same thing going on in him is going on in me. And you, you can just fellowship in that. And of course, I feel that way about a lot of you. I feel like I'm, a, I'm at a family reunion, a bunch of cousins here. Hallelujah. A good family reunion. Uh, where you're free to say, praise the Lord. You know, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't know if any of you ever watch uh, those old reruns of Mayberry and Andy Griffith. But I found this. Somebody said that the reason Mayberry was so peaceful was that everyone was single. <clears throat> Think about it. Andy was single, Barney was single, Aunt B, Floyd, Howard, Goober, Sam, Gomer, Ernest T. Bass, <laughs> Helen, Thelma Lou, Clara, and even little Opie, single. The only married one was Otis, and he was drunk all the time. <clears throat> I don't know what kind of message that sends, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to just have fun this morning on the, uh, I always bring my books with you, but I just ask you a favor, uh, by the grace of God, Gene and Betty have just so been a blessing to us and helped us with a website, I just can't tell you how grateful I am, but anyway, we're, we're trying to send out an email just every once in a while just to say what's going on, we're still alive, you know, think about being evangelist, you always feel like out of sight, out of mind, everybody forgets you, so anyway, put a list over there to just sign up and we'll we won't belabor it, but send out one once in a while. It'd just uh, be a blessing to us. And also the books that some of you probably, mostly probably read them, but there's some back there that we brought with us. Um, you ever think something is somebody else's fault and you find out it's yours? <laughs> this guy was complaining because his wife couldn't hear much. She wouldn't hear very good. So he asked the doctor about it, and the doctor said, well, tell you what. Why don't you just test out her hearing? Stand about 40 feet from her and say something, and then stand a little closer and just see how long it's going to take her to hear you. So he said one night he gets home and he says, Honey, what's for dinner? He's about 40 feet away. No answer. So he gets about 30 feet away. Honey, what's for dinner? No answer. 20 feet away. Honey, what's for dinner? No answer. 10 feet away. Honey, what's for dinner? No answer. So finally he gets right up behind her and he says, Honey, what's for dinner? And she said, Jack, for the fifth time we're having chicken. <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway. Okay. Somebody made a statement to me the other day, and this is the subject this morning, but he said he was referring to some Christian he'd known for a long time, and he said, 
he said that one person, that Christian, is someone who's never left their first love. And it so burned in me. Here's a statement that there's, because I think most of us, at some point we lose our first love. We walk away from God. God hasn't walked away from us, but we walk away from God. I've told you before, but there was a man one day in Waco, Texas, and he called me. I don't know him real well, but he, he called me and he said, Brother Steve, God has spoken to me, and he said he's given me a word for you. And he, he said, do you want to hear it? And I said, oh, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, he said, the Lord told me to tell you he misses you. And it was in a season of my life where I was real busy with writing books and real busy with ministry stuff and real busy. And all of a sudden, I get this word long distance from Texas. Hey, the Lord has a message for you. He misses you. And I thought, and all I'm doing for the Lord, but that's what is in his heart. So I'm going to read the scripture to you. This is from Revelation chapter 2. And it says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, he said, I know your works, I know your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and you've found them liars. You have persevered and have patience. You've labored for my name's sake, and you've not become weary. I'll tell you one thing about God. He's a great psychologist because he's ready to kick their rear in, but first he compliments them. Reminds me of the guy that told me, if you can get people, if, if God can get you laughing, he can get his fist in your mouth without breaking your teeth. <laughs> and, uh, and so like, God's going to bring this correction to this church. And he compliments him. He more, I wrote him down, he says, number one, I know your works. You work hard for the kingdom of God. I know your labor. You are committed. Number three, I know your patience. Boy, you, you, your patience has been tested. You're good. You're good. He said, I know you cannot bear those who are evil. You know, you're not compromising. You're not getting in with the world. Number five, you've tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and you found them liars. You got a real discernment running. God's just saying, I'm proud of you. I, number six, I know you ha how you have persevered and you have patience. I, I know God loves that, that perseverance, that pursuing him. Going through stuff, you've persevered. And then God says, finally, number seven, I know you've labored for my name's sake and you've not become weary. How many know the scripture says that you've not become weary in well-doing? God says you've done all this, patting him on the back. And then he lowers the boom. He puts on his pointed cowboy boots and he said, nevertheless... Would you say it with me? Nevertheless. One friend of mine said, never will I settle for less. Hallelujah. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Then he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. You ever been around somebody that's just fallen in love, two people? Doesn't matter if they're 20 or 50, it'll make you sick to your stomach watching. <laughs> wow. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. We all know about falling in love, but a lot of times we're guilty of falling out of love. We haven't turned our back on God. We've just walked away from that intimacy. He says, repent and do the first works. What did you do when you first fell in love? It was nothing to talk. Melody and I, our first phone call was four hours. It was nothing to talk. 
all night sometimes to someone. It's nothing. And I, I know it used to be among Christians. You get so excited and talk about the Lord. You say, I got to get some sleep, but I don't want to leave the fellowship. There was an old poem. Mary had a little lamb. It was no ordinary sheep. It joined a bunch of Christians and died from lack of sleep because, <laughs> be, be, because there's this. And he says, Re, remember from where you've fallen and go back and do the first works. Go back and do what you used to do where you used to be nuts wacko about me, where you used to stay up all night and, and talk and talk about the things of the Lord. <laughs> Melody has a, some relatives that uh, they got married very young and now they've been married 67 years. Lady's kind of cute. She says, they told us when we got married, it wouldn't last. And she said, it may not. There's days that it's really hard. <laughs> uh, but... I never cared for marriage counseling. I really never had. In fact, I'd rather, even at this point in my life, I'd rather be beat up by a motorcycle gang than, than do marriage counseling. But when I've done marriage counseling, it's always the same. The woman will say, he's a good man. He's a good father. He, he landscapes the yard. He's a good provider. One time I even remember, remember he took the trash out. And she'll go on and on about his good qualities, but she'll say, but one thing, there's time I just need a hug. There's just times I need to just tell him I'm pretty. And he doesn't seem to notice. And for that reason, I'm not interested in much in this marriage anymore. The man might say, you know, she's a good woman. She's an excellent cook. I'm growing like crazy. Uh, the, the, you know, she's, she's a wonderful mother. She's a good housekeeper. She has this other job she does. She's just a wonderful person. But, but sometimes I just need some affection. I just need some attention. I just, I just need to... How many know it's no fun getting a hug if you have to ask for it? That takes all the fun out of it. Don't you love to be hugged when you haven't been... You just get hugged with your teeth in your mouth, you know, you're just there and you're just being hugged. So, and then he'll say, you know, as wonderful as she is, I'm hurting. And I think God's saying the same way. I love your labor. I love your patience. I love the gift of discernment. I love your perseverance, but I have an issue with you. You've walked away from intimacy with me. Wow. Now, I'm going to just cover several subjects real quick. Number one, I've learned there's four eyes. This will help you. There's four eyes out there. The first two, the devil has, and it started in the Garden of Eden, the devil has a strategy. And it all began with Adam and Eve to cause you, every one of us, to feel inferior and to feel insecure. God wants to heal that. Those are the two eyes. You can, you can erase everything else. Your problem is you, you're insecure and you feel inferior. Every one of us. That's happened at the garden. God can restore that. Not that you feel superior, but you feel secure in God. And you're content in Him. The other two eyes, the devil wants to steal your identity and your influence. When, when Satan came... Our, to, Jesus said to Simon, 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 Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat. It's interesting to me in Luke twenty two thirty one, he didn't say the devil, he didn't say Satan has asked for Peter. He said Satan has asked for Simon. The enemy wants you to go back and depend on Simon, your old nature. Simon has been Peter for three years but the enemy has, was messing with him and says, I want to sift Simon. I want to sift him like wheat. In other words, the enemy is out there to steal your identity. Most people don't know who they are. One thing about intimacy with God, if nothing else, you hang around God, love on God, and you'll begin to know who you are. You say, well, I'm an engineer. That's not who you are. That's what you do. I live in... 
South Carolina. That's not who you are. That's where you live. I'm married to so-and-so. We will pray for you.